are very welcome to this brief introduction to the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 23 through 31, followed by chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. As an introduction, our purpose is not to interpret or to teach the passage, but to provide background information that may be useful to you in your teaching ministry. So, let's get into it. The first part of the book of Acts was titled, Jesus Promises Power for Witness to the Nations. We are currently in the second part, The Apostles' Witness in Jerusalem and Judea. In part A, we saw how the church in Jerusalem was planted, and now in part B, how the church in Jerusalem expands. First, by the apostles' witness before the people of Israel, then before their authorities, and in this lesson, before the Lord himself. In the preceding context, after the Lord had healed a lame man in public, Jesus' apostles, Peter and John, were teaching folk inside the Jerusalem temple complex. The temple police arrested them and brought them before the Jewish Sanhedrin, or council. These officials ordered them to stop teaching about the name of Jesus, threatened them, had them beaten, and then released them. We pick up in verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices to God with one mind and said, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who, by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David your servant, said, Why are the nations insolent and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. As a help in your analysis and teaching of the book, we offer you a more detailed outline of the current passage, which you can download as a document by a link provided below. We read how the apostles, as they pray to God, they do so in agreement with one another. Jesus had promised, whatever you agree about on earth will be done for you by your Father in heaven. In their prayer, they cite specific scripture, acknowledge the Creator, believe the inspired passage from which they quote the content and from which they infer an application to their own situation. They make mention of the enemies of the gospel and exalt the Lord Jesus. Anti-Christian scoffers accuse Peter or Luke of misrepresenting Psalm 2, asserting that the term nations and peoples refer only to Gentiles because the two words occur in poetic parallel. Why were the nations insolent and the peoples plotting in vain. However, we note that although the word for nation, goi, usually refers to Gentiles, yet the word for people, am, often refers to Israel in the Hebrew Bible. Thus, Peter quite legitimately makes the following contrasts. He contrasts pagans with Israelites reading from Psalm 2 about nations, goyim in the plural, and peoples, amim in the plural. These he interprets as being represented by Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor, and by King Herod, leader of the Israelites. Pilate he identifies with Gentiles, who happen to be pagan Romans, and Herod with the peoples of Israel, including those who made up the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. We continue in verse 27. For truly in this city 
there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now these two verses translate a rather complicated Greek sentence, which we can render as follows. We're gathered upon truth in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom thou christened, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with Gentiles and peoples, Israel, to do that which thy hand and thy will foreordained to happen. A question arises amongst theologians. What was it that God had foreordained to happen? Many translations presume that the enemies of the gospel had predestined to take their stand against God and Jesus. Others, however, believe that God had christened or anointed Jesus the Messiah to do that which God had foreordained. Thus, there are two translations possible of that part of the verses. Those who belong to Reformed theology prefer the phrase, Gentiles and peoples gathered to do that which you foreordained. However, the alternative translation would read, Thy servant Jesus, whom you christened to do that which you foreordained. I prefer the alternative translation for several reasons. Logically, did leaders gather together to do the foreordained will of God? If so, then God had ordained evil. Does he? Or did God anoint Jesus to do his foreordained will? In this case, God ordains our redemption. Contextually, the phrase, your hand, in verse 28, is repeated in verse 30, referring to miracles of healing done through Jesus' name. Thus, it seems probable that God had anointed Jesus to extend his hand in healing the lame, both during his time on earth and through the ministry of his apostles. Furthermore, in Greek, the verb gathered is much farther removed than is anointed Jesus from the phrase, to do your will. In this case, we could diagram this complex sentence as follows in Greek, or as we do here in English. You anointed to do whatever your hand and purpose predestined to occur. And then, biblically, Jesus, during his ministry, quoted the prophet Isaiah when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. We resume at verse 29. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant it to us, your bondservants, to speak your word with confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant. Jesus. Continuing the provided outline, we read how they requested boldness and expected miracles. Verse 29, And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant it to your bondservants to speak your word with all confidence, whilst you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. We continue at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Later in the book of Acts, we will find that the Apostle Paul also experienced the shaking of a prison where he was confined. Continuing our provided outline, We've just read how that God answered their prayer by sending an earth tremor, 
filling them again with his Holy Spirit as they began again to speak the word of God with boldness. We leap ahead now to chapter 5, verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place amongst the people, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. The miracles were again happening through the apostles, and the unity of the believers was maintained. Other folk were responding, holding the believers in high esteem. Now, it is important to note that these miracles were signs of a true apostle. Paul himself would later write, The signs of a true apostle were performed amongst you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works, demonstrating that Paul himself was as much an apostle as were Peter, John, and the rest of the twelve. Luke had earlier written in his Gospel, chapter 9, how Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over the demons and the power to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing, a promise given only to the apostles. For the rest of us ordinary Christians, James would later write, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Christians who often, frequently, and passionately pray for their sick do see many healed. And in the last three verses, And increasingly, believers in the Lord, large numbers of men and women, were being added to their number to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any of them. The people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together as well, bringing people who were sick or tormented with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Our outline continues. Many new believers were added. Jerusalem's needy folk were healed, and other towns' needy folk were healed. Again, Anti-Christian, anti-biblical scoffers have laughed at verse 16 where it says, People from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem, noting that there were no other cities, there were only towns and villages, ignoring the fact that the term here translated cities applies to human settlements of any size. Again, may you yourselves be filled with the Holy Spirit as you study and teach this passage, leading others into an active faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, keep praying for the sick in His holy name, that many may be healed.